Hello and welcome to our last UN 2023 Water Conference talk show coming to you live from the SDG studio here at UN headquarters in New York. I'm Shakun Talasantharan. So the last three days have flown by and we're already getting ready for the closing ceremony. In this, our last of six shows, we'll be looking back at the conference and looking ahead at how we can maximize the momentum, the enthusiasm, the focus on water issues and make sure that there is follow-up, concrete action. We have a packed show for you today. We begin with our reporter, Haja Yakubi, who is standing by for us. Haja, it's the last day of the conference. What's going on? Hi, Shucks. Yes, indeed, it's the last day already, but you wouldn't be able to tell by the looks behind me. There's still a bustling hallway. You see people going in and out of last meetings, trying to snatch those last people away that they've been meaning to speak to do throughout the conference. So really a lot of action still happening right here. What's really exciting is that we actually got to speak to some of the people here earlier this afternoon. So let's take a look. We're on the last day of the conference. If you would have to mention one thing, one concrete action point that you're gonna follow up on when you're back home, what would that be? Um, water is life and whatever we have to do, we have to preserve water. I'm gonna make um, awareness, create awareness of the importance of uh, preservation of water and also management of water. We have met many friends and alliance building and creating groups that can kind of uh, create a voice for the type of things that we were worried about in this conference are going to be very important. Just the awareness and emphasis with regards to concerns related to water and sustainability. Also a lot related to women's issues. What is one concrete point of action that you're going to follow up on when you're back home? Decentralization. Hands down the most important one I come through. The big issue for me and the big opportunity is the rematriation of women's knowledge into water um, leadership and um, all dialogues around water planning for the security of water for the future. Hey, and Diane, if there's one thing that you could say that, that you learned during this conference, what would that be? So we learn a lot and we meet uh, plenty of people and also meet uh, very much uh, stakeholders. And once at home, we are specialized in advocating. We will continue advocating and uh, raising awareness. I get even more motivated, more pumped, because I think, okay, I'm not the only one thinking like, okay, just let's focus on, on the impact. There are more persons who think like that and th don't think too much on the risk, but on the impact and the, the, the outcome of it. A lot of people here inspired me to make more things that I was doing before. And I feel that now we have a bigger compromise with this um, things that we were doing before and we need to take action now and we don't have more time to do that. Water is for everybody. It, it, it goes beyond religion, it goes beyond ethnicity, culture and um, any kind of group of people. So that we can be better together. Here, here, the conference sounds like it certainly generated momentum uh, for water issues, Haja. So now what happens to that water action agenda? Yeah, Shucks, that's a good question indeed, because we're at the very last day, and in a couple of hours, the official closing ceremony will start in the General Assembly Hall. And that is also the moment where the water action agenda will be handed over by the co-chairs of the conference to the president of the General Assembly and also to the secretary general. Now, what's really cool to know about this is that the water action agenda consists out of voluntary commitments that people, governments, businesses, young activists, indigenous communities are making to create more water action. Now, this has been done throughout the conference, so these past three days, but also in the lead up to it. And I can imagine if you're watching and if you're thinking, well, I'm really inspired by all those people we saw in the video, but also in general to take more water action. Uh, don't be sad because you can actually still make a commitment to the water ex action agenda. So uh, that process will be continuing and we'll see the handover for that shortly in a little bit during the closing ceremony. Thank you very much, uh, Haja. We will be looking forward to that. So as the conference uh, wraps up, uh, one of the big issues is what happens with decisions that are made at this global international uh, level? Uh, how does it translate onto the ground as uh, concrete uh, solutions, actions there 
on the ground and, and that it addresses the needs of so many different kinds of people. Let's get the perspective now of Mercy Amokwando, who is project coordinator of uh, Action, rather, it's Hope for Future Generations, right? It's an NGO that's based in Ghana. Thank you very much uh, for being here with us. So please tell us about your work and what does this water conference mean for you and your organization? Thank you very much. My name is Messi Amokwando, as you mentioned, and I work with Hope for Future Generation. We are basically into community education, and our target is to educate women, community members, community opinion leaders. Our work basically is around advocacy. And so we form community groups, we meet community leadership. We know women, children, young people at that community level, you will find them most of the times at the water sources. Men take decisions, but they do not most of the times use this water point. And so if the decision makers do not use the water points and the people who use these water points in the community have no idea about how to preserve, how to protect, how to guide these water sources, then there is a need for them to bring them on board. So basically, education, awareness creation, forming community groups, forming community accountability mechanisms to address social issues. Because it is mainly women who are fetching the, the water. water, right, from those sources. So what's happened for you at this conference? Did you get what you came here for? Yes. For this very conference, I've seen a lot of people, have participated in a lot of events, and one key thing that runs through resonates with what we do on the ground, involving the very people at the grassroots, getting the indigenous people involved. At a point, it looks like we have neglected them. There's some sort of marginalization, either in a way of culture, we've marginalized people by way of gender, but then it is time to get the ideas of the women, the ideas of the indigenous people, the very people who live close to these water bodies. There is a need for us to value our water. How do we do it? We need to know where we are getting the water. What do we do? Whatever you value, you protect it. How do we do the protection? Back home in my community, in my region, a river stretches across four or five regions. And people who live along these river bodies implement or conduct different activities that affect these water bodies. And so there's a need to educate them. We need to stop certain practices. Wetlands are not useless places. In my community, wetlands are used for refuse dump, other things. Some people are also feeling, putting solid concrete to erect, um, erect buildings, and it would not affect the future of water in our community. Open defecation uh, and indiscriminate disposal of refuse needs to stop if we want to achieve the targets we have set for ourselves. So this conference was held at the global level. How do you think it can make a lasting impact at the local level? Yes, I would say decentralizing the action points that will come out. At the national level, there are steering committees. There are, there's a parliamentary select committee for water and sanitation. We have a whole ministry for water and sanitation. And so the coalition of the NGOs in water and sanitation, we need to take this final outcomes to the meetings at the national level, at the regional levels, at the district level. You know, in Ghana, we have a decentralization policy. At the national level, it looks broad, but at the, the district and the community level, what do we need to do? What is this household supposed to do that will promote and then protect water? So if a household A is implementing the right thing, household B, household C, in the end you realize that a community will stop doing some of the things that affect water and sanitation and that will promote uh, the, 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 the outcomes we are trying to uh, disseminate. And then one other thing is that we cannot keep the outcomes on the shelves. At the district level, there should be policies. There should be regulations. The people involved need to understand and they need to be involved. Policies cannot be taken at different levels for others to implement. So there should be involvement, there should be inclusion. The voices of the people at the grassroots must be heard, must be listened to. 
we need to give them the voice, give them the opportunity. It is time we stop taking decisions for people. Thank you. What's your parting message to our viewers at home? Yesterday, I was in one of the sessions uh, called Hearing the Unheard. And it's a story that resonates with me and most indigenous people. People are going through a lot. We need to give them the voice. And the, the special rapporteur for water and sanitation mentioned that you cannot achieve something if you do not dream. So it is time we dream about the kind of water and sanitation services policies we need to see. Then we work towards achieving it. Yeah. Thank you so very much, Mercy, for that rousing call to action. And thank you for all the work that you're doing. This work that Mercy and her organization uh, are doing is so, so vital. Uh, clean water, sanitation and hygiene are critical for human health and well-being. Let's take a look at another organization that's doing this vital work. Before the project, many people used to defecate openly because they didn't have latrines. And as a result, we had many people suffering from waterborne diseases. Ago ero kamano ne project yendi nike chnyaku bi omi abet gicho ma ber makoro sani o kanya idu tuo mar kolera nike juacho. As a community health volunteer, I visit households and uh, educate them on sanitation, and uh, we also collected data with regards to their sanitation services. We teach them on the importance of using latrine, on the importance of keeping latrines clean, how to wash hands, and we also teach them on the need to use clean and safe water. We are joined now by more experts who are water leaders in their respective fields. We have uh, with us uh, Anastasia Rutatina, who is a WASH specialist, monitoring and evaluation and gender equality and social inclusion at AMREF in Tanzania. And Dr. Miriam Haritz is Director General in charge of water from the German Federal Ministry of the Environment, Nature Conservation, Nuclear Safety and Consumer Protection. And Dr. Stefan Ullenbrook is Director of Hydrology, uh, water and cryosphere branch of the World Meteorological Organization, the, the WMO. If we could start with you, Anastasia. So we just saw a video of what some of uh, AMREF uh, does in Tanzania. You experience yourself firsthand what it's like to have to fetch and carry water over a long distance. And that inspired you to do the work that you're doing now, working with women, uh, uh, girls, young people, people with disabilities to improve wash conditions. Did what Mercy say resonate with you? Yeah, thank you. Uh, that is so much relevant uh, from the ground, but from the world itself. It's so vivid to most of us, as I said before. Today, up to today, still, despite all the effort that's been made, we still have approximately 2.6 billion people lacking those services, water, sanitation, and hygiene. And what does that mean? That means we still have girls who miss school for not having water in our community. We still miss women who cannot go to farm, you know, who cannot develop and do some economic activities because they have to go find areas to defecate, to fetch water. So those are th still things that are going on and are in our community, and they no longer think that we need to discuss further, but now we need to take action. And I think this uh, meeting and this conference, it was all about. So do you think people's needs on the ground are being represented, met at a global level, like at this conference? Yes. As you said, I'll present the, um, the people from the ground, the people that I work with, the community that I work with. And as one, I'm just one of the people that are in this meeting, are in this conference. And if you can see around and if you can witness, we had so many people, so representative across the world, across the different organization, the private sector, the government, everyone is here looking for solution together. So that's, uh, I can say, we have a vivid example. Now, one big question is, since there's no negotiated outcome document coming from this uh, conference, we have got a water action uh, agenda. So 
what steps must be taken after the conference to make sure that there is follow through because these are voluntary commitments. Uh, Dr. Haritz Miriam, uh, Germany uh, ha played a leading role in the preparations towards this conference. You've organized, uh, for example, the bond dialogues uh, for results in the summer of 2021. And uh, there was uh, a set of recommendations which were along the lines of the SDG G6, a global acceleration framework, right? So from this experience, what do you think is the best way to follow up on this water action agenda? Well, thank you very much for being able to participate in this show. And indeed, this is just a starting point, which is building on what we've done before. But we consider the follow-up process of the conference the real challenge. A UN conference solely dedicated to the topic of water has been an excellent starting point, but action must start now at all levels to overcome the global water crisis. With the Bonn Water Dialogues in 2021, you already mentioned, we defined key messages and recommendations for accelerating cross-sectoral implementation of SDG 6 in an inclusive and participatory process together with UN member states, major groups and other stakeholders. The conference as well as the Water Action Agenda are just a starting point. Results must be fed into the high-level political forum in July of this year and the SDG Summit in September. We also need regular conferences on water at the highest level to jointly identify and accelerate solutions and expect a transparent process for selecting co-chairs yeah. so different UN member states are given the opportunity to host a UN water conference. And we shall not wait neither five years nor another 50, 50 years, years before this happens again. And besides this, a more efficient, coherent, system-wide and cross-sectoral UN approach will be key to give the best possible support to member states. We need water in all policies. We certainly do. So uh, you're among uh, the nations, the parties who are urging for a UN special envoy on water. What do you think that could accomplish? Well, so far we have around 150 UN member states who support the call to appoint a UN special envoy on water, which is a concrete recommendation from the Bonn Water Dialogues. Appointing this political position will be a major contribution to ensuring that water remains a priority of multilateral cooperation even after this conference. And a special envoy can also play a crucial role in the follow-up commitments made under the Water Action Agenda. And as it is particularly countries from the Global South facing the biggest water challenges, we hope that the position will be filled with a high-level personality from the Global South. Uh, Dr. Raul Stefan, if you don't mind, sure. the WMO is part of uh, the UN Water Grouping, which is the coordinating mechanism for water here at uh, the UN. But I understand that each and every UN agency really focuses on its own part of the water issues and they don't really work together e effectively. What needs to happen? Thanks. That's, that's a very good question. Um, not each and every UN agency. I believe there's some 32 or so UN agencies that are part members of UN Water, and then there's partners of UN Water, which are another 40 plus. You, you might think, oh, you know, are they doing all the same? And I don't think so. Therefore, there is a coordinating mechanism from the UN. It's a within UN coordinating me mechanism. Member states are not directly steering that mechanism. Not yet, I believe. And uh, <laughs> um, so, so it's kind of to, to avoid duplication, but to, to do uh, transparency and be synergistic and, and, and complementary in our, in our approaches. And you might wonder, you know, why are so many waters just, why, why don't we have a single agency? I, I, that's an obvious question. But on the other hand, there's history to that. You know, there's been developments in all these different UN agencies. They, they look at the water from a different perspective or maybe more from a water supply and sanitation perspective. Others maybe from a food production, agricultural food systems uh, perspective. Others from the meteorology, water, climate perspective. That's WMO's role. Others maybe from science or disaster risk reduction. So there's all different angles water. We have to make sure that, that we, we're certainly not competing, but, but really are complementary and, and working together. and. Uh, this coordinating mechanism is, is doing that as, as good as they can, as, as good as the, you know, given the mandate. But, but we have to think about, is, is that still fitting the purpose? You know, do we need something more powerful? Do we need, do we need a bigger organization to really make a change? You know? and, uh, and, and scale up you know, the, this uh, water action that Miriam was just talking about you know, to implement. Then. Uh, is that the right setup? I, I'm not so sure. <laughs> well, because here at this conference, we're talking about breaking the silos. Yep. Right, you're saying that it's been looked at from 
individual perspectives. Now we've got to look at it as a whole. How likely is that to happen, do you think? Yeah, I, I believe in the overall coordination mechanism, you have to rethink the structure. So the internal UN coordination is, is a good thing to have, you know, for sure. In the given mandate, UN Water does the best they can do. But, but if you rethink that structure and also as a follow-up process, as Mirwin was just talking about, do we need more regular meetings? You know? Last UN Water Conference, I was, um, I was in primary school. You know, we can't wait so long, you know, another 40 whatever years. And, um, now, so, so having, having a, a process, having a platform to really discuss the follow-up on these um, actions, you know, where do we progress? Where do we need to readjust? Where do we need to, to maybe reconsider resource allocation mandates and activities? So therefore, a more regular meeting is, is absolutely necessary. And a, and a necessary platform needs to be there to, to, to have a chance to meet and discuss. And that needs to be mandated by the member states and also believe member states have to really play a key role. So internal UN organization coordination is a good thing to have. But, but we need a more powerful instrument, I believe. Yeah, certainly if I just uh, can step in there, Please I do. fully support that. I mean, the water sector also in the, on the UN level, but also on national level, is so fragmented. And I heard somebody saying we don't have to reinvent the wheel. And I think that's very applicable here. The knowledge mm. is out there, but we need to get out of the silos, as you said, and like con connect the things and get them on the political agenda in a cross-sectoral way. Mm. So, uh, now the WMO uh, is part of UN Water. You've got all this fantastic data. Uh, what do you see your role as moving forward? Do you think anything's going to change as a result of this conference? But I, I, I think I, I'm not cynical about, about the conference. You know, <laughs> even if you had to wait for 50 years almost. No, I, I really believe that there's change. There, there's good developments. There's renewed commitment. You hear that in every corridor and every site meeting. We had some exciting uh, commitments for new programs, and it's often. Um, joining forces around a very specific concrete project. That's what brings us together. That's what really allows us to, to use the complementarity in our, in our expertise. For instance, there's, um, uh, the Netherlands just pledged yesterday um, a, a mega program for the, um, well, in, in the field of water, uh, uh, quite a significant one, 50 million for East Africa, Ethiopia, Sudan, South Sudan, and Uganda. And where, where we look at early warning systems for floods and droughts. And then, the WMO works together with UNDRR, Disaster Risk Reduction, with the IFRC, with the International Red Cross and various Red Cross agencies. And, uh, um, and in another program also with ITU, a Telecom Union, you know, you don't think immediately about water if you think about that, but for, for alerting people, for transmitting information about, you know, is there a flood warning now? Do need people act? And so therefore also other agencies, which are not necessarily the core water agencies, are, are absolutely necessary to, to be successful in these programs. So I, I believe that the, the strength is coming together in specific programs and, and make a difference there. You uh, started to talk about commitments made yeah. at the conference. Uh, Anastasia, what have you heard in the hallways, in your conversations? Have there been any commitments, any solutions presented that you thought, yeah, this is going to be a game changer? Yes. Um, actually, uh, what I like most and one of the let's say three uh, key output that I got from out of this and from the corridors, as you said, everyone is willing to contribute. Like he said, coordination and uh, collaboration is a key. Yeah. So like we have been working in separate, in individual basic kind of way, but now everyone is willing to see, hey, what do you have in German? What can we learn from there? Is there anything that is applicable to my country as Tanzania? You know, so everyone is so willing to seek, to, to be open up, to be true to themselves in order to find a way that can bring the greatness out of it. So that is one key takeaway that I really, really uh, look upon it. But also throughout the conference, we have observed that uh, as much as WASH is so important to women, it's right, everyone, it's right for everyone, but it's more important for women and girls. But in the field, there's few number of those people, of the women and girls represented. Working in the Yes, in the, in the field. Yeah. It has been more of the technical part of it, but now people, they're willing to also put the social part of it they are willing to also to add more women into it because you know when it's it's in your shoes it's easy to see simple and innovative solutions and corroborate with other people to find better ways so that is like a plus and a hundred percent uh point of uh, like the way we look at things now but also last but not least it's an innovative way on financing on the wash sector 
you know that is something that we might be not saying that it's a challenge but when you admit it's a challenge it's easy to see how can we spin the wheel how can we move from zero or to hundred or to thousand to billions how can we uh, put innovative way from subsidies from grantees from different kind of this financial that can help other sector so i think those are the takeaways and if we take them forward and uh, work on them, oh, <laughs> I can see SDD <laughs> being closer enough. Wonderful. That's very uh, en encouraging, right? Yeah. Uh, we were talking about finance actually in, in one of our shows yesterday and the need for the financial sector to revalue or how it looks at water and, and water related investments. So, um, are there any commitment solutions that you're working on, AMREF is working on mm -hmm. in Tanzania that you think can be rec uh, replicated elsewhere? Yeah, um, AMREF is, uh, is trying to empower and give girl the agents uh, to girls and women mm -hmm. to access safe food, sanitation uh, and hygiene, including menstrual hygiene in their health and health to improve their health in the community. But also it's trying to promote and enhance much sectorial approach of the wash. As we can see, there is a wash with the nutrition, wash with the agriculture, but how can we integrate different project, different activities to make sure that we are meeting. Uh, it's been a wash being a corner uh, center of everything, but integrating other project across it. If it's a uh, agriculture with wash, it's even nutrition with wash, if it's health, if it's climate change, we should, do, we should all like do it together. Not like just one, uh, looking at uh, one thing, but it's at um, complicity like at a complexness and complex way of it. And uh, lastly, but also support and empower the community itself. We say now we're going for the nature bears innovative solutions. If you don't empower community to be able to bring out, you know, those solutions, we won't be, you know, we won't be moving forward. And AMREF is committed to empower the community to be able to demand the service, to be able to see of what they need within their community. Yeah, so that is what I'm what they are aiming at from this conference. We keep hearing about the need for cooperation and coordination because we know we need it, right? Uh, and Miriam, you are um, with uh, um, an organization, uh, you are the president actually, of the International Commission for the Protection of the Rhine, the ICPR, I believe, an example of cross boundary cooperation right there. Can the ICPR serve as an example for other countries? Yeah, I like that reference actually, that we need to look at what is already there and what can you learn from other countries. And I think that um, the International Commission for the Protection of the Rhine, which I have the honor to president for the next three years, has already been established in 1950 and is a good example because it was founded only a couple of years after the Second World War. So already then, the former enemies along the Rhine understood how important it is to work together to improve the situation of this particular river, which flows through several countries. In over 70 years of its existence, the Commission proved its usefulness in many ways. It provides a platform for regular exchange among countries in the Rhine Basin. And this helps to foster mutual understanding and trust building, the essentials for successful transboundary cooperation. Transboundary cooperation in the water field needs time, and it is a process. It is not a done deal. It needs to adapt to the circumstances. For long-term success, a joint program called Rhine 2040 was adopted in 2020 to steer the activities in the next two decades. It tackles the challenges that the ICPR faces right now, but also in the future. Such long-term commitment is also needed internationally. My ministry's International Water Corporation focuses on Sub-Saharan Africa, which is the continent facing the greatest challenges in achieving SDG 6, and at the same time the most vulnerable to the water-related impacts of climate change. So I'm very pleased that we have been able to contribute together with our partners two voluntary commitments under the Water Action Agenda that focus explicitly on two of the largest river systems in Africa, the Congo and the Niger Basin. So here we see parallels from the Rhine down to Congo and Niger. And I think that's very important to see the commonalities and differences, but work together. Um, 
Can you share Germany's uh, approach to how, um, as a national government, to coordinating with other stakeholders, uh, local governments? How, you know, it, it, what's the best way to work together from the German perspective to implement solutions? Well, I'm, I'm not sure whether there's a perfect way, even in Germany, but uh, <laughs> decentralized governance has a long tradition in Germany. We're a federal state. So we have established an institutional framework that allows for close cooperation of municipalities, regional governments, and the national government on all aspects of water management. This mechanism will play a crucial role in the implementation of our national water strategy, which was decided by our cabinet only last week. And we have an outlook until 2050 how we need to strengthen water management, water resilience in view of all the challenges ahead. In most countries around the globe, water services supply and water management are decentralized, as this brings decision making closer to the local communities that depend on this vital resource. However, many urban and rural municipalities, particularly in developing countries, lack the necessary resource to fulfill these tasks. And achieving SDG 6, therefore, often requires decisive implementation of decentralization policies by national governments, including also fiscal decentralization. The discussions during the last three days, as well as the Water Action Agenda, are a great starting point to foster cooperation between different levels of governance and to enabling particularly local actors to fulfill their roles together with NGOs, with the civil sector, with civil society. Actions need to be inclusive and tailored to the needs of those who implement them. So let this be the watershed moment that the world needs. Well, Stefan, let's look at the role of science. The WMO has a wealth of data, of information that is available to support policymakers to make well-informed decisions. So how was that reflected here uh, at the conference? I think, the, uh, interesting enough, while, while we have a wealth of data, you might think we, we still need more, you know, and there's really necessary to, to continue monitoring measurements of different variables. Think about uh, numerical weather predictions. You know, to be able to, to forecast the flood, you need a very good prediction of the rainfall of the coming days and weeks. And ideally also for droughts, we need to predict what's going to happen the next season. And that, that's still very, very difficult. When it comes to short-term dynamics, floods, we, we need a quite, a, quite a dense data network to be able to calibrate our models and make, make quite accurate predictions. And if we don't have that, and in many places from Africa, and Asia, Latin America, we, we have very, very sparse networks only. We have a very dense one in Western Europe, that's true. Well, so we have a lot of data, but we actually need more. We need to reinvest more in uh, measurement of hydrological variables. And then the next thing, if I may, it's uh, sharing meteorological data is still relatively easy. And we, you know, we, there's a, a history to that. When you fly airplanes, you need to, have to, need to know the weather. <laughs> so therefore, you need to share your data with your neighbors. Yeah. But in hydrology, that's very difficult. The, the water data in many countries is still not shared between boundaries, you know. Oh, Can you imagine? Because of boundary issues, yeah, and security and trust issues. Is exactly, and there's still the feeling that this is a national secret and they have to keep by themselves. And uh, from WMO side, we, with our members, we, we very much stand for a unified data policy. And for the basic meteorological parameters, there's an agreement with all 193 member states of WMO. But for the water data, that's still something to, uh, to get to. <laughs> and we hope to expand this open data policy also to, to hydrological variables in the coming years. But it still needs a lot of uh, massage and convincing, and uh, everybody needs to agree on that. How do you think your data can be uh, put to better use by every level of government, not just yes. at the top? Well, it's well starting at the bottom. You know, you work in uh, water supply and sanitation at the very local level, and and also the hydrological work we are doing is is absolutely should be locally led when you when you think about the disaster um, action uh, and preventive action or or even doing doing a hazard. Huh? There are therefore uh, data collection at the very local level, involving citizens in in the observation, involving them in the. In, in the necessary action before, during, and after a flood, for instance, or a drought, is absolutely critical. At higher level, and, and you know, while, while I really appreciate the great examples from the Rhine Basin that, that were just shared with us, and the long-term commitment and the, the knowledge and capacity is, is outstanding. But still, one and a half years ago, we had major flooding in the Rhine. It cost only the German economy 35 billion in that order of magnitude, which is a lot of money, even for a very rich economy. And that was 
while they have probably among the best hydrologists and weather, weather models and so, but still, um, the, the internal communication, the governance during the disaster situation was, was not, not maybe always perfect, if I may say <laughs> so. And, and there's lessons to learn. Oh, uh, to learn. So, uh, so therefore, um, it's, data can help and support, but it also needs an overall governance structure that is effective and, and able to act. Again, on its own, <laughs> right? You need everything coming together here. Absolutely. Um, yeah. the, the bigger picture. So last question here. Um, we can keep talking, um, but uh, what is your big one ask, one hope going forward as this conference wraps up? Miriam, if we could start with you. Hmm. Excellent question. Well, we are very excited to um, listen to how the closing ceremony um, of this conference uh, will go on. And I've checked already, there's a website you can check and see the commitments. We have, I think, last time I checked, more than 660 commitments. And I remember coming here and there were often questions about like, what is this conference about? And th you're not going to be negotiating a binding agreement. So what is this for? What will be the outcome? And can that really matter? And I believe, yes, strong, very strongly it can matter. Because if we look back at the last and first water conference in Mar del Plata in 1976, mm -hmm. that led to binding commitments. But still, if we look what has happened ever mm -hmm. since, it wasn't a guarantee for a success. So the fact that we have gathered the world here in New York and that we have over 660 commitments that really are very concrete and very specific. And as you mentioned in the beginning, it really, these are concrete projects and they serve local communities. I think that's measurable. So the commitment we see here, I'm really very proud of, of being part of this conference and, and I feel this momentum and I really, I, I know the risk is there that we fall back, right? We mm. live in, in restrained times and, and geopolitics are a challenge and everything, but. We shouldn't forget, I mean, water, water is life. We've heard it so often, but it's nonetheless very true. It is. Um, Anastasia, what about you? What's your one big ask? Oh, I think I agree with, uh, with the last speaker. And uh, one big ask that I wish uh, we could take forward from this conference is like, as she said, that we don't have, in the beginning, it wasn't like bounded agreement, actions, you know. But uh, when you look at those commitments that has been listed so far, one thing that I wish that we can do as a long, as a long, that long, long different round table that we had during the meetings, if we can have them in our respective countries with all the stakeholders that are here. So the minister, from the minister level, from the, uh, all the agencies, embassies, from the local NGOs, from international NGOs together at the table to come up with few or you know some five top five that we can go forward toward the end of uh, completing the SDD that can be very accountable so we can assign law to each other at a country level so that is one ask that i wish to mm. yeah. stefan your ask <laughs> if you look to the past you know there were a number of un war, uh, conferences about different topics and they also had a lot of commitments but not all necessarily changed the world <laughs> so the big danger is what we discussed at the beginning you know it's now time for committing it's uh, 600 commitments are there but what's the follow-up mechanism you know what's the performance measurements in these commitments who is held responsible and accountable i think the, these are the challenges we need to address and therefore we do need a better framework to follow that up we, we discussed earlier here about this uh, a platform to regulate regularly meet interaction. I'm not necessarily in more meetings, you know, but, but we, we, need, we need a moment, you know, where, where we are, where we can progress, uh, show the progress. And if, if there's no progress, we, we somehow need to, to readjust or be held accountable for our earlier commitments. I think that's, that, that is something where I really hope in the closing now we, we, we get some hints on how, how that's going to look like. And then we all, then we have to commit to, to our commitments <laughs> and actually do it. And hopefully we're going to have a special envoy for checking on that. Yeah. Hopefully. Thank you all so very much. Uh, there is so much more to uh, discuss, but uh, you've made such very relevant uh, points in, in our conversation. So we all need to be working together. We need to be working together now. We need accountability, yes. right? And uh, a regular platform to show this progress so that what has been achieved with all these commitments made actually follows through and we see something concrete happening that actually changes the situation. We move the dial in the right direction, right? And we actually make progress 
in solving this water crisis. Uh, thank you all so very much again. So as, as you pointed out, no water, no life. Let's take a look at this video. The most pressing water issue in my community is plastic waste pollution in sea and river. The solution includes young people. We are innovator, entrepreneur. How can we use the skill of young people to accelerate the water action agenda? My country suffers from arsenic pollution in its groundwater. The problem is multifaceted as the needs of the population compete with the needs of economy and industry. How can we find a fair balance between economy, the population, and environment? In my country, our groundwater and rivers are drying up due to climate change. And this is affecting our local economy, especially in rural areas. That is why we are working on sustainable management of micro-watershed to enable our communities to develop resilient economic activities. How can water be a driver for resilient economics in this context of drought and water scarcity? Well, with us uh, here in the studio now, we have uh, Sultan Rahim Zoda, who is chair of the executive committee of uh, International Fund for Saving the Aral Sea, and Hank Ovink, who is special envoy for international water affairs uh, for the Kingdom of the Netherlands. And we also have Saraj Kumar Shah, who is global director for the World Bank Group's Water Global Practice. Thank you all for joining us here in the studio, the last day of the long-anticipated UN 2023 uh, uh, water conference that was organized, co-hosted by both your countries, the Republic of Tajikistan and the Kingdom of the Netherlands. So if we could start with you, Sultan, what is your main takeaway from the conference? Thank you. Uh, the first, water connects. The King of the Netherlands in his opening remarks mentioned the partnership of Tajikistan and the Netherlands. That is a good example how water connects different countries. Through the interactive dialogues, we connected continents, we connected developed and developing world. We had co-chairs from the developed countries and developing worlds. And uh, water connects people, cultures, countries. The second moment is water is not only water. The Secretary General of the, uh, of the UN mentioned that it's, although it is a conference about water, but it's much beyond water. What is the source of the food security, energy security, environment sustainability, and the uh, source of our life, basically. And the third moment is uh, water actions. We need actions to achieve SDG 6 and other water-related goals, and we see that the people are inspired. Tajikistan and the Netherlands, during all the preparatory process, we have been calling different stakeholders, member states, UN entities, financial institutions, and others to come to the conference with the commitments. And we are very delighted to see that around 700 commitments are already registered in the Water Action Agenda, and among of them, two, more than 200 just for the last two days. And the third moment is continuity. We need to continue our work. We build momentum. We have to keep this momentum, and President of Tajikistan is his opening remarks mentioned that we need the regular meeting at the UN level, and he suggested to have the next UN conference on water in 2028, and also suggested the Dushanbe water process as one of the uh, follow-up mechanism uh, to keep this momentum and to achieve more success. Our last uh, panel of guests also said there is the need for more regular meetings so that there is a platform for accountability, right, so that we that can see... That was the main messages in the final interactive dialogues about the water decade we attended this morning. Saroj, what do you think? We've said over 660 commitments made so far. We heard the UN Secretary General saying we need a bold water action agenda. Is this bold enough? 
The first thing I have to say that the, this conference has been a very important milestone in transforming the, the understanding of the political leaders and the global leaders about water, importance of water. Um, what I have seen is that the political leadership coming from the countries to the conference are bringing a very solid set of commitment to really understand and transform water in their countries. At the same time, you also see business leaders, civil society organizations also moving forward and to join forces to really implement some of these priorities in the countries. Um, the real test of all these 700 plus water action that has been committed will be in its implementation. And all that I can say is that you can count on World Bank Group to support the governments to implement. We are the largest funder of financing, concessional financing for water. We currently have a portfolio of more than $60 billion. We are ready to do more. What it takes essentially is for the governments to build right set of policies, right institutions, regulations, and then they could use their resources, our resources, to mobilize more private capital. And there is willingness from the private sector to come forward if there are what we call ease of doing business, enabling environment, the foundational issues are addressed. And I'm very motivated to see the conversation that have happened between government and the business leaders. And as I have shared in many of my interventions that water sector is really going to embark on perhaps the most uh, we've ever seen in private public coming together at the national level, in the local bodies, in municipalities and towns, that is what will take for these 700 plus actions to be implemented. So I'm very excited about it. Hank, did one moment in particular, was there one particularly memorable moment for you in the last three days? One? <coughs> Many? <laughs> no, I think building up off on what uh, both Sultan and Suraj uh, and echoing also what they're saying, uh, both of you is the partnership part. Eh? Uh, it's of course not enough. Eh? Uh, we're here uh, 46 years after the first. Uh, took us quite a bit of time. Also took us 27 cops to get water, you know, a sliver of water in the outcome uh, document of a cop. A food system summit had one and a half years ago with even men without mentioning water. So we can talk about water sec food security without talking about water. So there's a void. The, uh, second, we come together here with thousands of people. So it shows the world cares. And I think that is something to capture. The question is, are we willing and able to do so? So the follow-up is going to be of critical importance in practice, in all the communities and the places that are at risk, with still billions of people lacking access to water, sanitation and hygiene facilities in 2023. A human right, but for a lot, not even in reach. Uh, Climate change exacerbating the scale of water-related risk. The Global Commission on the Economics of Water made it very clear. We broke the hydrological cycle. So more water in our skies, less in our grounds, in our rivers. And what we have is more polluted and more saline. So the thing that stuck with me, one, is the magnitude of the, the challenge is acknowledged. I think it's of critical importance because we haven't thus far. Second... On this follow-up, we need to do much more and much better than we've been. We have to treat this as the global disaster it is and take concerted action. And that means uh, there was this call for an envoy. One envoy is not enough. We're, we're only two. I mean, we need, we need a, a legion of envoys. We need a task force of uh, member states and a whole of society approach. It has to be science and society based. We need to really capture the moments that we have in front of us, the SDG summit, the summit of the future, the World Social uh, Summit in 2025, to ensure that water never leaves these agendas. So I think one thing, yeah, the, you know, the urgency and the magnitude, okay, we get it. What are we now going to do? Are we sticking to the promise? And the water action agenda is a way to do so, to show it on the ground with the private sector, with funding, with governments, in the places at risk. But are we driving that agenda that, you know, next week? That is the beginning of driving that agenda. I'm hopeful if I look at the partnership that we see here, but I'm also challenged by the, the enormity of that. We have time for closing thoughts from everyone. Uh, 
Saroj, if we could start with you. Yes, I think the, uh, uh, as I said, this conference provides us a tremendous opportunity to really bring all the stakeholders together at the country level, what we call a multi-stakeholder partnership, which can start essentially defining the role of various actors, what kind of policies and reforms governments will put forward, what kind of public financing they would bring in their budgets. They need to spend more money on water. They're not doing enough now. They need to reprioritize spending. They need to spend that money well. They need to create the enabling environment for private sector to come in. And they need to start essentially looking at what I would call better governance of the water sector, which creates opportunities for all the other stakeholders to come in. And, and this, this particular piece of work is what I think is something that the World Bank is going to lean forward and focus on countries where we see strong leadership to take this agenda forward. With, we had a, a very good set of panel with the business leaders who were here at the conference. And I'm, I'm amazed to see how much convergence you're seeing now between public leaders and the business leaders to really join forces and take this agenda forward on water security. Because water is essential for life, it is essential for business, it is essential for climate change, it is essential for energy transition. So you can't do anything without water. So that's why I said, I'm so happy to see that this conference has created that momentum and it is for all of us now to really move into action uh, with a much greater sense of urgency, I would say. Yes, Thank we you. need urgent action. Sultan, your closing thoughts very quickly, if we could please. Yeah. I think we need to change ourselves to change the world around water. The conference united all of us, as Saroj mentioned, bringing together member states and different stakeholders. So my message, let's stay united for water and let's be committed for action. Action really is needed. Wonderful. Hank, Last your word. closing thoughts yeah, very, very quickly. Very quick. No. So coming off of this, I, need, I think we really need to bridge all the differences and divides and water provides that safe space to do so and then catalyze. So I would say a global pact for water without a negotiation, but from a provocation that we saw this week turning into a partnership. So let's not negotiate, let's provoke each other in such a way that we can build the most amazing partnership for water security for all. Thank you all so very much. May this conference be uh, something that we can look back on and say that this is where the world really started to come together and solve our water crisis collectively and for the global common good. Thank you all to Thank all you. our guests for uh, here being here with us over these three days and also to our viewers at home. Thank you for watching and uh, that's it. From us here at the SDG studio, goodbye for now. Thank you. Cooperation at every level is needed now. We must use this conference to find a permanent home for water in the UN. My hope is that knowledge on protection against water is spread across the world. My wish is on accessible and inclusive blue phone that will ensure funding on water action especially for youth initiative. We call to come together across generations to protect Lake Sevan and other freshwater lakes. My wish is that you encourage and fund young people to come up with solution in biodegradable plastic. My wish is for you to invest in women and girls, invest in their health, water and sanitation. We call on the authorities to prioritize and accelerate the access to safe sanitation in the agenda towards a water secure world. We wish everyone on the disasters forefront to be safe and protected. Water needs to be put at the top of the political agenda. We need to take meaningful action today. If not, by the time my generation is in the seats that you occupy today, it will be too late. Thank mm -hmm. you.